For decades, cities have invested in building up their public transit systems and reducing the number of cars on the road. Hundreds of millions of people flock to transit hubs around the world every day as they travel into work in the mornings and go home at night. Or at least they used to. The coronavirus pandemic has turned the daily commute into a public health risk. From swiping a subway ticket, to touching a payment screen, or squeezing onto a crowded train, the way many of us used to travel now means risking exposure to a deadly virus. That's the perfect uh, scenario for the virus to be transmitted, because you've got so many people packed in so closely, the risk of infection is actually quite, quite considerable. To get people to commute again, many transportation networks are trying to make that journey safer. In some cities, this has set off a race to find different ways for people to move. So we wanted to know, how is the pandemic changing the way we commute? A good place to start is with trains. Before cities can start building out their grand visions for the future, they have to deal with the immediate issue of social distancing and sanitization. Mandatory masks, social distancing signs, and one-way walking systems have all become new normals in cities like London and Paris. But the reality of reopening cities means that some transit systems can get overwhelmed pretty easily, and overcrowding makes social distancing particularly difficult. So many are focusing more on deep cleaning. The MTA is testing a UV light system to try and kill COVID-19. In rich countries, you can even talk about nanotechnology to recover or cover the inside of, of buses or public transit with surfaces that repel or kill the virus. In Hong Kong, these robots are rolling through trains spraying disinfectants. Some Beijing subway stations are using a temperature screening system to check for potential fevers, while also using mobile reservations to try and manage the flow of people and cleaners are using electrostatic sprayer packs to clean trains in many places. But measures like these can be expensive. Professor Julio Davila researches cities and transportation systems in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Unless it gets sort of to this extent that is affordable by cities in the global south, I don't see that happening anytime soon. One way to make rides safer is by not letting trains get too full. And that means sacrificing some ticket sales, which in turn means less money to operate those same trains. One thing that's clear is that public transit systems around the world are in very difficult financial situation. Unlike rail systems, roads are a little easier to modify for public transit. One of the advantages we've got with how you manage the road network is that you can implement measures pretty quickly. But you know, redesigning an underground tube station is, or providing extra capacity there is a, is a tough one to do, uh, and they take many years to do. New York City is expanding its bus-only lanes to try and alleviate overcrowding. The idea is that if buses have more space on the road, they can increase service, which should make it easier for riders to maintain social distance on board. There's every possibility there's going to be another huge wave of infections just because we are, you know, carrying the virus to different, different places. Dr. James Hildreth has spent the last four decades researching viruses. If you refuse to wear a mask, as far as I'm concerned, you should not be allowed to use the service uh, because not doing so puts others at risk. Shared surfaces and limited air circulation pose a particularly big risk for bus drivers, who are among the people who don't have the choice to work from home. After at least 33 London bus workers died from COVID-19, the mayor temporarily had passengers enter the bus from the middle doors to avoid contact with drivers. Since then, the city said it's worked with researchers to improve the protective screen between the driver and passengers. Now, some buses are running with limited capacity and skipping stops when they hit that limit. I think it's inevitable with a mass transit system that there will be times when social distancing is very difficult to manage. What I tell my team and my family is that we should all expect to be doing this until the middle of next year. In the meantime, some cities are looking for ways to help people avoid public transit altogether. Local governments are now widening sidewalks and taking space 
away from cars. We have been kind of reallocating road space for pedestrians incrementally uh, pre-pandemic, uh, but I think the, uh, the pandemic has given it greater urgency. The worry I've got is that uh, is because people aren't using public transport, they're returning to cars. So that's one of the reasons why we're reallocating road space for pedestrians and cyclists. If I had unlimited money, I'd probably put more into cycle hire, really, because I think that's turned out to be really successful. London, Milan, Paris, Bogota and Berlin have all announced plans to expand cycling lanes. And governments are encouraging people to walk to work if they can. Some have talked about limiting the need for people to use public transit by building up local economies with the 15-minute city. It's an urban planning concept that puts people's basic needs like food, parks, and schools all within a 15-minute walking distance. How will the city function going forward? Is it going to flip to a kind of more local London? Uh, or is it going to flip to more less people living in London? You know, we don't know. Another idea to take pressure off public transit systems is to reevaluate the way we work altogether. More companies are allowing employees to work from home, and some transport authorities have suggested that employers might be asked to stagger shift times to avoid overloading trains at rush hour. So what does this all mean for commuters? So one of the things we're thinking about is, you know, when this pandemic is over, uh, how do we get people back onto public transport in a way that they feel safe? Public transit networks don't operate under a global set of rules, so it's ultimately down to each city and transit network to decide how to move forward. And it, what it will do is, is actually focus the minds of um, transit authorities, local governments, to say, more than ever, we have to make sure that the whole spectrum of users, the poor, the rich, the women, the people with disabilities of different kinds have to feel safe about that. That's a big challenge.